It was a bright and sunny morning in 18th century London, but Robert Robinson's mood was anything but sunny. All along the street, there were people and they were hurrying to church, but in the midst of this crowd, Robinson felt a very lonely man. The sound of church bells reminded him of his years past and his faith in God when it was strong and when the church was an integral part of his life. But it had been years since he had set foot in a church, years of wandering and disillusionment and gradual defection from the God whom he once loved. That love for God, once fiery, passionate, had slowly burned out of him and it left him dark and cold. Robinson heard the clip-clop, clip-clop of a horse-drawn cab approaching behind him and turning, he lifted his hand to hail the driver, but when he saw the cab was already occupied by a young woman dressed in finery for Sunday, he waved the driver on. But the woman in the carriage ordered the carriage to be stopped. Sir, she said, I'd be happy to share this carriage with you. Are you going to church? Robinson was about to decline, but then he paused. Yes, he said at last, I am going to church. He stepped into the carriage and sat down beside the young woman. And as the carriage rolled forward, Robert Robinson and the woman exchanged introductions. There was a flash of recognition in her eyes and she stated that his name was interesting, that it felt like coincidence because she then reached for her purse and she withdrew a small hymnal. She opened it to a ribbon bookmark and handed the book to him. I was just reading a sonnet from a poet named Robert Robinson. Could it be? He took the book and nodded. Yes, I wrote these same words many years ago. Oh, how wonderful, she exclaimed. Imagine I'm sharing a car carriage with the author of these very lines. But Robinson barely heard her. He was absorbed in the words that he was reading. They were words that would one day be set to music and become a great hymn of faith that is familiar to all generations of Christians. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. And he slipped his eyes to the bottom of the page where he read, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it, and seal it for thy courts above. He could barely read the last few lines as tears started to form in his eyes. I wrote these words, and I lived these words. Prone to wander, prone to leave the God I love. The woman suddenly understood, and she reached over and grabbed his hand. And she said, you also wrote, here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. And she said, you can offer your heart to God again, Mr. Robinson. It's never too late. And it wasn't too late for Robert Robinson. In that moment, he turned his heart back to God, walked with him all the rest of his days. And it's hard to imagine that the author of such a great hymn, or that any great hero or heroine of history, would ever struggle with God. But as we begin 2021, I think the question is right now before us, where are you? Where are you in your walk with God today? Maybe uh, you made a New Year's resolution. You said, I'm gonna get my finances together, right? I'm gonna balance that checkbook. <laughs> and maybe you've decided to lose weight, exercise more. Maybe you said, you know what? I wanna spend more time with family. Start looking for a better job. Start looking for a bigger house. But what about your faith? Have you made a resolution to grow deeper in your faith or to burn more passionate in your faith? Does it burn brighter this year than it did in years past? Could it burn brighter? Or do you think that spark could be dying out? at the very tip of 2021, and we are now looking forward into a new year, I want you to know that new things are possible. 
In fact, our God is all about second chances and third chances, isn't he? Our God is the God of forgiveness. He is the God of grace, and I know he would love nothing more than to rekindle our relationship with you this new year. So as we are here this morning thinking about renewal and fresh start, I'd like to look together at uh, one of the last revivals that swept the nation of Judah and ask ourselves one last time, maybe why did this happen? What did these people do that renewed their faith in God? And the answer, I believe, is going to be a key for us as we perhaps experience revival in this coming year. In Kings, in the second, uh, second Kings, actually, uh, chapter 22, there's a story that's set for us. It says Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidiah, the daughter of Adiah of Bozkath, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all the way of David, his father. And he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. So Israel had had a bad string of leaders, disobedient leaders, but Josiah is good and he goes about reestablishing everything. He repairs the temple and in so doing, his high priest, Hilkiah, finds the book of the law, basically their Bible. And he thinks to himself, I bet this is important. <laughs> And the Bible says that Josiah began to hear the words of the law read out loud, and he was so upset, he tore his clothes. And he said to everyone in the room, great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. And so from there, he went on to destroy all the pagan temples. He burned pagan books of worship. He restored the practice of Passover. And in the next chapter, Josiah gets everyone together for a public confessional and a rededication to God. 2 Kings 23 says, Then the king sent, and all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem were gathered to him. And the king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the prophets, all the people, both small and great, And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people joined in the covenant. All right, so what do we see the people doing in this story. First, we see in verse two that they renew their promise, right? They renew their promise. The people all examine themselves. They admit, hey, we're going in the wrong direction. And they all agreed, we can't continue on like this. We need to change. And how did they respond? The end of that says they all joined in the covenant. What's a covenant? Uh, Just so that we're all on the same page, it's an agreement. Yes, of course, it's an agreement, but it's more than that. It's an agreement that has a legal binding. The people join in to that agreement. To do what? Well, to do what it says. To walk after the Lord, to keep his commands and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and soul, and to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. The people said, we have gone long enough doing it on our own and going our own way, and we wanna turn back. We wanna go back to how God does things. We are gonna rededicate our life. We are gonna go now in God's direction. That's a very big promise, right? It's like putting your hand on the Bible and saying, with every ounce of my being, on all of my focus and all of my energy, I'm gonna follow and obey everything in this book. Do you think you could do that? Admittedly, that perhaps we've been going in the wrong way, or that we've been a little lazy in our discipleship. 
And we're now going to re-promise to put some extra focus and some extra dedication into our walk with God, or perhaps the mission of our local church. And listen, this doesn't mean that you're being re-saved, okay? Josiah and the people weren't saying, we haven't been your people, and now we want to be your people again. No, they were saying, we haven't lived up to our end of the agreement. But from this point forward, we're going to act like people of God. We want to come home again. And what do we see them do next? Verse 19 says, And Josiah removed all the shrines, also of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which kings of Israel had made, provoking the Lord to anger. He did to them according to all that he had done at Bethel, and he sacrificed all the priests of the high places who were there on the altars and burned human bones on them. And then he returned to Jerusalem. What do we see Josiah do? He removes all the distractions. The people took a long, hard look at the things that were taking them away from God. And for them, it really was worldly influence. It was pagan influence. It was all those temptations that the world offers. They even removed people <laughs> from their lives, right? And, and admittedly, very violently. But they recognized, you know, sometimes there are people who are in our life and they are unhealthy for us. And they are spiritually uh, toxic for us. They pull us in the wrong direction. They pull us away from God. They're bad influences on us, and so they rededicate themselves to God, and they remove all the distractions and all the obstacles that are in their way. And that's not uncommon to see uh, at a new year. When people make a commitment or, or a resolution, they will often purge their wardrobe, or they'll purge their pantry in the hopes that if they succeed, if they can reach their goal, they're going to do it by removing those temptations, removing those distractions. And listen, you, you are not alone when it comes to distractions. It's not an easy task to stay on task, right? We, we want to accomplish our goals, but it's, it's difficult. And the question is, well, how come some people can do it and not others? How, how come they can do it and not, not me? Well, Maybe you were never taught how to focus. And it's funny how all through our school days, we're never taught how to learn or, or how to focus, even though that's all we did. It was just assumed, and ultimately it became this kind of hit or miss for many of us if we ever ended up on actually knowing how to do things well. And since we were left to our own devices, it's, it's up to us to find ways to master how to focus. I, I could not focus as a kid growing up. I used to sit in the back of the class. I, I doodled on paper, I fidgeted, and I got terrible grades. I, I failed classes in high school, I failed classes in college, and I was even put on academic probation. Eventually, I learned that I had to change my habits. If I ever wanted to change my life, you know, our hangups and our habits are distractions and they keep us away from our goals. This is why New Year's resolutions almost always fail because the habits that we've already formed that are so strong and ingrained in us will always win. The Greek physician, philosopher, Hippocrates, said it first, and he said it best. For extreme diseases, extreme methods of cure, as to restriction, are most suitable. In other words, drastic times call for drastic measures. If we expect to change and grow, then we need to take drastic measures, like King Josiah does. So how can we learn to focus? Well. Keep the goal out in front of you. First things first, why do you even need to focus, right? Do you, do you want to become 
a skilled guitar player? Do you want to write that novel? Do you want to start your own business and work from home? Think about it. Knowing why we need to stay focused is going to help us push through those tough times and, the, and all that tediousness. Seeing the goal out in front of you is going to help you accomplish it. That's why our ability to focus is really tested when we need it most. What's your goal? What's your goal this morning? I hope it's a deeper and more spiritual relationship with God. I hope that's why you're here. How are you going to keep that goal out in front of you this year? Yeah, the whole year. This whole year. Isn't that important enough? Your relationship with God, isn't that important enough that you're going to want to work on it all year through? What, what visual or mental aids can you give yourself that's going to help keep that goal out in front of you? Keep that goal where you can see it. Second, you got to eliminate all the bad habits, right? If you're trying to make a good habit or a new habit, you got to push the bad ones out. And you won't get very far if your car is broken, right? I know you love all those bad habits, and that's why they're there, right? I mean, there's a reason why we call the TV the idiot box, and it's not because that that's the box where you watch all the idiots. That screen, right? It's that screen. Whatever that screen is for you, it, it is a time sucker. It is a life sucker. Nobody is going to get to heaven and wish that they had watched more screen in their life. Too much screen time is directly linked to symptoms of depression and anxiety. It overloads your senses. It reduces your ability to focus and it messes with your attention span. You feel like any of those things have gotten worse? Have you started watching more screens in your life? Also, since 1971, causes of nearsightedness in the US have doubled. And in Asia today, nearly 90% of teens and adults are nearsighted. It can lead to vision problems, substantial back and neck pain from bending over and constantly looking at your device, and also hearing loss from wearing headphones. Studies show that kids who spend more than two hours a day on screens scored lower on thinking and language skills. We also sometimes read at night off of our phone, you know, catch up on all those comments and likes before we go right to bed. But looking at a screen at night interferes with your internal clock. It confuses your body in terms of when to sleep and when to stay awake. You know, on that same note, one study of over 177,000 students found that insufficient sleep was not only associated to screen time, but that it also led to weight gain. And weight gain leads to higher risks of conditions like diabetes or symptoms like increased blood pressure or cholesterol and dangerous blood sugar levels. And some researchers will even say that too much screen time impacts how long you live. There are pagan buildings, pagan shrines, and pagan altars all over your life. What is trying to distract you from the things that are the most important? King Josiah burned them all to keep his people focused. He took drastic measures. What drastic steps can you take? Third, I would say plan your day before you start it. The best way to get something done is to plan to do it. A lot of times we live our life reactionary. But if you plan your day out, you'll actually accomplish more. If you have 20 things to do today, you could be scattered and, and you could all be in your head and you could start to get unfocused again. But if you break it down into bite-sized pieces, 
baby steps, you'll be surprised at what you can accomplish. Weight Watchers, they give you a large goal, sure, they give you a large goal, but on the smaller side, they celebrate every single pound that you lose. In other words, take it slow. You're not gonna become everything you wanna be overnight. If you're gonna reach success, you're gonna take small steps. And then I would just say manage your momentum. If you wanna push a boulder up a hill, you're gonna need momentum. You're gonna need to keep going. Don't stop and take breaks. I think oftentimes when you turn a corner, after you've started something new, you think, hey, this is a good point to stop and take a break. But when you do that, you're relying then on your discipline to come back after your break. It's that Wednesday that you wake up and look at your clock and say, you know what, I don't think I'm gonna exercise today. That means it's gonna be harder to do on Thursday. Every little bit is gonna help build momentum and push you closer and closer to reaching your goal. You know, as Christians, we call this stage repentance. Without repentance, there's no revival. The people knew they were going in the wrong direction. They said, we need to focus. We need to get rid of all these distractions. And we need to keep on going. Listen to something that Oswald Chambers wrote. It is not repentance that saves me. Repentance is the sign that I realize what God has done in Christ Jesus. Is it my obedience that puts me right with God? Never. I am put right with God because prior to all else, Christ died. By the miracle of God's grace, I stand justified, not because of anything I have done, but because of what Jesus has done. Sinful men and women can be changed into new creatures by the marvelous work of God in Christ Jesus. So let's go back to our people who are in Judah and see what they do next. They remember God's provision. They remember God's provision. Verse 21 says, And the king commanded all the people, Keep the Passover to the Lord your God, as it is written in this book of the covenant. Remember I said that King Josiah brought Passover back. That's a holiday feast. It's a party. It's a celebration, like Thanksgiving. Why do you think it's important that they bring back a holiday? Well, what is Passover? For the Jews, it was a religious observance. It was worship. But most importantly, it was a time they remembered how God freed them from slavery. It's also important for people because it's a way for them to remember their place in that relationship. Passover reminds them that they rely on God, that they need God, that God is in control. And those are good reminders, aren't they? We need those reminders in our life, don't we? You and I, we didn't save ourselves. Every day we are given a gift from God. Just living in this world that we get to live in and spending it with family and people that are close to us. So as we try to renew this dedication to God and capture the spark again and restore some of this revival in our relationship with God, maybe the key to drawing closer to Him is tied then to the remembrance of all the things that He provides and does for us. You know, that's one of the reasons why I think the offering plate is so important. It's not the church that needs your money. It, it's more that you need a reminder that you are dependent on God for all of the blessings. And that reminder, that act of worship is built on trust. Look at what the next verse says in the book of Kings. It says, for no such Passover had been kept since the days of the judges who judged Israel or during all the days of the kings of Israel or of the kings of Judah. In other words, since King David, right? From one of the first kings all the way to one of the last, 
They celebrated Passover with King David, and then 300 years later, they get back into the habit. How long has it been since you celebrated God's provision? How long has it been since you allowed God to inhabit every part of your life? Listen, God gives you everything, and you trust him. And so in your obedience, you then give back a portion of what he has given you. Maybe this is the year you take a larger leap, trusting God with your finances, as you begin to see God put bread on the table. The next thing we notice that Josiah and the people do, which is, I think, very crucial to their revival, is that they rekindle their passion. Verse 25 says, Before him there was no king like him, who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. In 1746, revivalist preacher and philosopher Jonathan Edwards published a book called The Religious Affections. And in that book, he argues that true religion is affectionate. Jonathan Edwards says there is no true religion where there is no religious affection. If the great things of religion are rightly understood, they will affect the heart. If you want to change anything in your life, especially your dedication to God, then you need to get passionate about it. Psalm 73 says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Psalm 84 says, My soul longs, yes, faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. What about us? Do we have passion like that for God? I think this is the third week in a row that I've quoted C.S. Lewis, but he says it like this in, in his book. He says, The only thing Christianity cannot be is moderately important. Has there ever been a time in your life when you were closer to God? Because the bottom line is, you are as close to God as you want to be. You can have as much of God as you desire. You can be as passionate for God as you want. And nobody can do it but you. It's your decision. Church, I know that you love God. I know that you want to follow him. Perhaps your passion from God ah, is being suppressed right now. Perhaps you've allowed other things that are taking his place in your life. The church in Ephesus had the same trouble. And listen to what God says to them in the book of Revelation. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. The scriptures say, do you have any idea how far you've turned away, how far you've fallen? Turn back, recover your first love. Listen, if you have left that love for God, if you have lost that passion for God, I would say, turn back. Recover it. Recover that passion that you have for God. John Wesley was once asked the secret to his own passion. And you know what he said? He said, I ask God to set me on fire and to let people watch me burn. Or, as Robert Robinson wrote in his hymn, Come Thou Fount, we are very much prone to wander and prone to leave the God we love. But, as he did, we can also 
find the road back. We can experience a new beginning where hopefully one day we too will say, here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this brand new year. And we know that it's still going to be an upward climb. Things aren't magically going to get better. 2021 is not going to be going to erase all the sins and darkness of 2020. But Lord, as we stand here at the beginning of the year, we want to grab your hand as we take a step forward. We can't go anywhere without you. Can't do anything without you. And the only thing we want to accomplish this year is to love you more and to love your creation more. May we be the church in 2021. May we draw closer in discipleship to you. May we study and examine your word more closely, that you would give us a fire and a passion for these pages and give us the diligence and the obedience to obey them. May we speak and act in accordance with these scriptures and that wherever we go, people will know us by our love. Amen. I hope you had a great Christmas, a great holiday. I hope you had a great new year. Happy new year. It's 2021. I love you guys and I hope to see you guys soon. Have a blessed year.